so I get to lead an organization called World Compassion. It was founded by my father, Terry Law, 54 years ago. Clearly, I wasn't around then. And we work in countries that are considered hostile to the gospel. And so we empower, train, equip, resource the local church in countries like Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan back in the day, way back in the day, the USSR before it was, you know, when it was Russia um, or USSR, communist countries like that, Myanmar today, Cuba, we do some church planning projects in. So those types of countries and everything we do is to empower the local church to help them reach their Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. We come alongside them, hear their heart and vision for what they have for their country, for their city, their community, and we help them strategize, train, and resource them to go further faster. And so that's, in a nutshell, what I do every day. And so I find myself in, a, in conversations with people about the days that we live in. You know, we're watching an incredible revival play, take place in Iran right now. Over the last couple of years, we've been a part of uh, introducing over 250,000 people to the gospel message in the country of Iran. And so I was just over in the Middle East a couple of months ago, and I was meeting with some of our leaders. We've got, uh, for our organization, we've got about 65 house churches in Iran that we're connected to regularly. And then we're connected with other ministries and networks about what, through what God's doing in that country. And we fly them out of uh, Iran into another country in the Middle East, and we spend four days just pouring into them. It's a time of retreat and reprieve for them to be rested, and we get to hear their hearts. We get to teach them. They get to go swimming. They get to sleep in. They get to just get, get refreshed. And um, it's amazing to hear the stories that are coming out of Iran. And inevitably, uh, over the last couple of years, we hear of people's hearts opening to the gospel message. And what's happening in Iran right now is what people have seen done in the name of Islam is causing people in Iran to question their faith in Islam. Muslims are not bad people. Islam is just deception. So let me make sure our hearts are correct as we think about this. But they're questioning their faith. And because of that, they're beginning to ask questions about other faiths, which if you read between the lines, this means there's a huge opportunity for the body of Christ to reach into a nation that's over 90% Muslim. How they have seen their, their, their nation governed since 1979 underneath the Ayatollah regime. Ayatollahs are spiritual leaders that basically lead the country. Laws in Iran are built on Islamic ideologies rooted out of the Quran. And so an entire generation of people don't really like the way life has gone. Last year, we saw women dancing in the streets, waving their scarves and burning them. That comes from Islamic beliefs. And so people are beginning to open their hearts. And by the thousands, they are literally turning away from the heritage of the religion they grew up in, and they're seeking truth elsewhere. That doesn't mean they're coming to Christianity. It does mean the church has a huge opportunity. And so our organization over the last couple or over the next year set a goal to reach 140,000 people with the gospel message there, networking with other ministries and it's an incredible story. That's not what I'm talking about. But the picture I'm trying to paint is the world is shifting. Things are happening. And sometimes people talk about, man, these days we live in, what do you see? What do you see around the world? Well, I see what I just explained to you. But then when I begin to look at home back here in America, I begin to see something different. And it's this post-Christianity thing that's taking place. And people are like, well, are we living in the end times? Are these, are these the end days? And it's like, I don't know. The only scripture in all of the Bible that communicates when the end times will get here is found in Matthew chapter 24. And it said, in this gospel, the kingdom shall be preached to every nation, and then the end will come. Nation is ethnos or ethnic, linguistic group or language group. The gospel has to be presented into every nation and then the end will come. I don't know when that will be. The Bible says that Jesus doesn't even know when the end will be, that God the Father is the only one. So he gave us an answer without giving us an answer. So it leaves us frustrated. Are these the end times? I don't know. But the preceding verses before that begin to outline what those days will be like. Matthew chapter 24, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Nations will rise against nations, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be earthquakes. There'll be pestilence or viral pandemics. We've knocked that out in the last six months, all of those. Done, check. <laughs> These are signs of the times. Let's go further into that passage of Scripture. I don't have time to read it, so I'm paraphrasing. People will be offended. They'll betray one another. False prophets will rise up and deceive many. And the love of many will grow cold. What's wild about that passage of scripture, it's not talking about the world. As Christians, a lot of time, our heart posture immediately is to start pointing of what we see, what's going on. He's talking about Christians. He's talking about you and I. We live in some interesting times. We live in interesting days. 
And I share this not for us to point fingers at the world, but for us to look at this reflectively in our own lives to make sure that we are guarded and we're protected from not falling prey of what these times may be. And I'm not here to predict in times. My stance is we're going to get there when we get there, okay? We're not going to know, and we'll know. But in the meantime, let's keep taking the gospel forward, okay? But we can be aware in our own hearts and our own lives of what might be coming to guard ourselves and our loved ones and one another to protect ourselves from becoming those people that Jesus outlines in Matthew 24. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, I'm going to read this out of the New King James Version. You might be very familiar with this passage of Scripture, but it says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. I also think we see that in the classroom. Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Should we keep going? Slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, good night, Paul, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. The Passion Translation translates that last sentence instead of pleasures rather than lovers of God, more than lovers of God. Once again, Paul is not talking about the world and people outside the church. He's speaking to Christians. He's warning Paul, your people may run into this. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us through the word today. You all could be at risk of this. And that's the place that I want to speak to us from today. I've got to work to keep, keep, keep painting a picture, so hang with me here. I promise you this won't be so heavy the whole time, but it's serious, okay? This is some statistics. My assistant sent these to me a couple weeks ago, and I was like, I just, I just want to communicate this. Well, I found a place to communicate it to you all today. Here they are. It said, this is, the question was asked, what Christians look to most for guidance when determining right and wrong? 43%, these are Christians, 43% of Christians rely on Christian beliefs or the Bible. So I haven't gone on yet, but that should bother you. Okay, that statistic's too low. 41% rely on common sense or they leave it to themselves. 8% rely on philosophy or reason. The rest of them were like they didn't know. They were, they're confused, okay, so they're, they're so low it doesn't matter. 18% of Christians do not believe the Bible is the word of God today. I don't know how that works. 6% of the United States of America has a biblical worldview, meaning I'm 43. The country I grew up in and the country we live in now are not the same. The culture and society, our environment's not the same. The Bible says that judgment starts in the house of the Lord. So today is about looking into the word of God, again, as James says, as a mirror, to reflect where our lives might be. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will forewarn and forearm us. I think he's doing that through his word and maybe through this message today. But people are walking away from the Lord. Isaiah 5.20 says, Be aware of those who call evil good and good evil. They say darkness is light and light is darkness. Bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Does that sound familiar? That's the fulfillment of Isaiah 5.20. In the last days, people will mock the truth and follow their own desires, 2 Peter 3.3. 3. We are living in the time that Christians included will take God's word and they will twist it to fit their own fleshly desires, to create their own truths, to fit to what they want. And instead of looking into, the, into God's word and it being a mirror that's supposed to reflect Christ for us to become, we look into the mirror and we see an image of ourselves. Ourselves become our own God. That's what Paul is speaking to here. A time of deception. We're warned of this in, in, in Hebrews chapter 3. I'm going to kind of dovetail here off of what Pastor Bill spoke about last week of unbelief. And the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, be aware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. In departing from the living God... But exhort one another daily why it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. He was using, in the reference of this, the context of this is Israel. In just the book of Judges, over a 300-year period, 
Israel was dis- disobedient to God seven times. We read throughout scripture of their disobedience. And then they're falling away and coming back in disobedience and falling away. And it's because of their disobedience that they led to a place of a hardened heart. Disobedience to God's direction hardened their heart. Repetitive disobedience will harden our heart to the things of the Lord. Judges 21 through 25 blames it on this. This is, this is the cause. That everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's the problem. It turned their hearts cold. The love of many will grow cold. We begin to look into God's word and we don't value it. We don't honor it. There's a lack of the fear of the Lord. Even as the church, maybe we're becoming too casual. Maybe that that means you and this may feel corrective or heavy, but God loves, corrects those he loves. This message is for me just as much as it is for you. They had repetitive disobedience, Israel did. But repetitive disobedience leads to a hardened heart and unbelief is a result of a hardened heart. And people begin to fall away. We can see what's happening in the world. We're warned right here in scripture of these days or these times that we live in, but yet it still happens to people. So how can we guard ourselves from what's happening? Man, people who are deceived, I know, I know of people that are deceived. There's people that have come in and through this church that I believe are deceived. And here's the thing about deception that we learn in, in Matthew chapter 24, and I'm not going to really preach on this, I just want to mention it. That if you know somebody who's deceived, or if you've been deceived, or you think that you're you're struggling, you can probably attach it back to a place in a time of your life where you were offended. Many will be offended. Many will be tra- betrayed. And many will be deceived. Offense opens the door of betrayal, which opens the door to deception. You begin to question because your heart begins to grow cold. And you begin to question God's word, and it's true. The church offended you or somebody in the church offended you, and you carry that offense in your heart. And rather being obedient to how his word instructs us to handle that, we hold it. And it calluses our heart, and it leads to unbelief, and people begin walking away from the Lord. They begin to walk away from the church rather than staying connected and in a family and a healthy environment where we can flourish with one another. We know these things. What is required of us to be guarded? Let me begin to... To, to stitch this together for you. Let's go to John 15, 9 through 12. I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. I love the words that they, they, they use for this. It says this, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. This is Jesus speaking to us. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Does that mess with anybody else? I thought his love was unconditional. Yeah. I'll explain. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I've loved you. Every statute, every command of scripture, everything will eventually tie back up to or be tied to love God with all of our heart, soul, or mind, or love each other as Jesus loved the church. Those two will will all, all come back to that. This verse is not saying that we have to perform to receive his love. His love is unconditional. That's the truth. So what is this saying? We have to obey his commandments to remain in his love? God is love. Obedience is not what we do to keep his love. Obedience is what we do to stay connected to him. Remember that he is the vine and we are the branches. When we are grafted into him, we remain connected to him as we continue to operate in a place of obedience. He is the source of life that we get all of our nutrients for to go and to produce the fruit and to live the life that he's called us to be. Obedience is about connection. It's not about earning his love. So there, we answered the question. We don't have to be, be worried. His love for us is still unconditional. He is the source of life. Obedience listens submissively and it acts immediately. And I'm gonna teach from that place a little bit later on. But that's why in Hebrews chapter 3, it said, as the Holy Spirit says, today when you hear the voice of the Lord, don't harden your hearts. I would say that right now in this moment, as you hear the voice of the Lord, don't harden your hearts. Adam and Eve were in the garden. We, they separated, humanity got separated from God because of disobedience. Don't eat this fruit. What did they do? They ate the fruit. Disobedience separated us from God. Through one man's disobedience, we were separated. But through another man's obedience, we were reunited with God. That's the gift of Jesus. That gift is free. We don't earn that. There's nothing you can do to earn that. There's no amount of obedience that you can can perform 
to earn that. That is a free gift. I want you to make sure that you understand this, and I'm very clear about where we stand on this issue as I talk about obedience. You cannot earn salvation through obedience. It's a free gift. It's a covenant relationship. It's by grace through faith. Grace is his favor, his power, and his ability. God exercised his sovereignty. He exercised his, his power and his ability by sending Jesus, his son, to the earth. His favor, because he loved us while we were still sinners. He favored us. He wanted to restore the relationship with us. So he sought us out first. He came after you first by sending his son. And his son gave his life for you to die for you. That's an act of grace. But you can't have a covenant relationship unless two parties engage. My wife is over here in the front row. I did not tie a noose around her neck and say, hey, you're going to marry me. Okay? Like, if I go to hug her, she's going to hug me back, hopefully most of the time. It's a squeeze, you know? It's okay, we're in this together. That's a covenant relationship. So it's by grace through faith. Through faith, then, is our response to his grace. It's, God, I'm trusting you. Jesus, I'm trusting you. That through you, that I am saved. So it's not of works. It's not through obedience. But we stay connected to God through obedience. What else happened to Adam and Eve in the, in the garden? They were kicked out of the garden. Adam and Eve's disobedience kicked them out of the very environment and the atmosphere that God intended them to live to cultivate a life in. Our obedience keeps us in that environment, keeps us in the atmosphere that God designed us to do life in. That's what it means to remain in his love. God is love. We're remaining in his kingdom. God's kingdom is his way of doing things. Culture can be defined by it's how we do things here. There's a certain way that God does things in his kingdom. So when we get outside of doing that, we begin to separate ourselves from the kingdom, from the source, from the nature. We begin to sever ourselves from the vine by our own choice. See, God is sovereign, but in his sovereignty, he gave humanity choice. One one thing I like to point to, if he wasn't from the very beginning, he could have swerved in and stopped Eve from eating that fruit. He let her choose. He lets you choose him. He chose you, but you have to choose him back. That's that covenant relationship I'm talking about. But it's our choice to obey him that keeps us connected to God, that remains in that kingdom, into God's way of doing things to flourish. So obedience keeps us connected. It's his kingdom way. And because we're connected to him and we remain in his presence, we remain in his love, in that atmosphere. I hope I'm doing a good job trying to articulate this, to illustrate this. That there's a protection, there's a covering. We just sang about it, which was uncoordinated, which means we're on the right page. There's a protection, there's a covering that happens when we operate in obedience. Psalms 91, here's your homework, go read Psalms 91 today. I know there's a lot of mamas out there that read it and pray it over their kids every day, but just go back and read it again. But it starts off with this, those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall, shall abide in the shadows of the Almighty. The secret place. The secret place is the place that the world is searching for, because they, but they can't find it. It's only available to those who are obedient. For we are hidden in Christ Jesus now. The secret place of operating in obedience is what protects us, it guards us. It provides this safety net around us. It's his favor that guards us like a shield. It goes before us and prepares the way. But it's predicated on obedience. You think about all the times throughout scripture that God told Israel, be careful and obey. You go read Deuteronomy chapter 11, you're gonna read what I'm talking about right now. Carefully obey the voice of the Lord. If you obey, it even is in the New Testament. It's even in red letters. It's still a part of the New Testament covenant that we have with God that it requires obedience. And I think sometimes in the American faith, our American, we've gotten too casual towards God's word. Everything's got to be a feel good, but there's something that's required of us to live the life that God wants. Otherwise, to me, it's cheap. Not salvation, not his love. Those are gifts. But everything else requires an act of obedience. Over 359 times in Scripture, the word keep, at least in the New King James Version, is what they use. But that word keep in the Greek, it also obey. Over half of those times re require us to obey a command to see something. Obedience is a part of this walk with the Lord that we have today in the New Covenant. How do I remain in Him? Obedience. Even in Luke chapter 6, we were singing about it today, and this, this story, I think, comes from Luke chapter 6. The, the, the man who built his house upon the rock, right, and obeyed, I'm paraphrasing this because I haven't read it lately, but I think it's in Luke chapter 6, who obeyed the Lord was like a person whose house was built on a foundation. This is Jesus talking about us being obedient to his teachings. 
It protects us. It creates an environment. I think about Noah. We all know the story of Noah. It had never rained before on earth. And God tells him to build this really big boat so all the animals of the earth can come in there and him and his family. And it's like, you know, there's a lot of questions that go into that crazy story. But what's phenomenal about that is it says that Noah, in the recount of, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, that he moved with godly fear. The fear of the Lord instigated obedience in Noah's life. And because of his obedience, his family was protected. Everybody else in the globe died. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What does the Bible say? Have no other gods before me. Yet the king is demanding that people bow their knees. And in straight defilement to the kingdom, when everybody else around them is doing it, they're questioning the truth that they believe in. Maybe that sounds familiar today. And we're asking to bow. We're asking to, the culture's asking us to bow to things that we believe true or what God's told us in scripture. They stood with strength. And they didn't bow. The king throws them in the fiery furnace. We know the story. He looks over and there's a fourth man in there. They were in that secret place. In the midst of hell burning and raging around them, there's a covering and a protection over them because they chose to walk in obedience to the Lord. They found the secret place. They were hidden in the shadow of the Almighty because of their obedience to Jesus, their obedience to God. Man, I've, I've thought about this over the last couple of Really the last year, two, three, four years now, I guess. But 30 years ago, how old are we as a church? 30-something years right in there? Should know that. God put the name Guts on Pastor Bill's heart because it takes guts to serve God. You think God knew what he was doing 30 years ago for the world that we live in today and who we're supposed to be? We're supposed to be a people that takes guts to serve God. I really don't mean that to be cliche or to Pastor Bill and Pastor Sandy. I mean that to be, y'all, we're living in some, some days right now that it's gonna require some moxie. We ain't, we're not playing. I mean, we don't play church anymore. This is 2023, that what's going on in the world, the world's not playing. We've gotta be people that are willing to live obedient lives. Obedience causes growth, it produces fruit in our life. I know obedience, you know, when we talk about it most of the time, it's pretty heavy. Hopefully it's not too heavy right now. But obedience in the kingdom, man, it leads towards life. It leads towards life abundantly. It's not a burden. It's a blessing. It's the opposite of what our nature, our fleshly desire feels. Look at John 15, 4 through 5. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. Again, obedience keeps us connected to him. We can't pr produce fruit unless we're obedient. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Remain, dwell, abide, live in, reside, stay there. How do we stay? Obedience. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. But from apart from me, you can't do anything. Man, obedience is, is, leads you to the flourishing life that we all talk about all the time. But I think sometimes we're frustrated and I just ask, are you, are, is there a place in your life that there's disobedience? I'm going to make this really practical for you here in a minute. Obedience keeps us that environment. It keeps us in that place where our lives can be healthy, our relationships can be healthy. Obedience produces joy. That's what Jesus said. I tell you these things that your joy may be full. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Well, how do you think Nehemiah or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived the fiery furnace? Their joy was their strength. The funny thing is that story actually ends and it says they're dancing in the fire. Man, that's Old Testament, and Jesus says, uh, you can go back and read it in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's story. Their obedience not only protected them, it produced joy in their life. They're dancing in the fire when all hell is breaking, literally all hell is breaking loose in their life. Man, I'm just going to be obedient. doesn't mean you're not going to walk through stuff. It just means you reside in the secret place. There's a covering and there's a protection. Obedience keeps us connected to one another. I'm going to read some themes from Scripture, and I'm going to tag the word obedience from it. And I think it's going to hit you a little heavier, in a good way heavy. It's going to bring the awe of God to maybe some things in your own life, relationship issues that you might be dealing with. How about the obedience to forgive? Not the choice, the obedience. Obedience to go directly to someone who has offended you, to work it out rather than a gossiper to carry it in your heart and allow your heart to grow cold. Obedience, not a choice. Obedience not to carry offense. Obedience to humble ourselves before the Lord. 
Obedience to turn the other cheek, obedience to serve one another, obedience to honor one another. These aren't suggestions. It's coming from the God who put the air in our lungs. Obedience to serve and to love one another as Jesus loved us. That means we've got to give our lives for one another. That's a bummer. Love is patient. Love is kind. You know what kind means in the Greek? To bend over backwards for the benefit of someone else. Obedience to do that. Obedience to make disciples. Obedience to be patient. Obedience to give. Obedience to wait on the Lord. These aren't suggestions. I think about people who struggle with joy, and this is a revelation I've got this week in my own life, so it's a question that I have for you. But if we're missing joy in our life, but yet God promises joy through obedience, then where in our lives are we disobedient? A lack of joy is going to be tied to disobedience somewhere. In your mind, your thought, your thought life, in your heart. We got to be people that are joy-filled, man. We are the solution to the earth's problems. So judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Let's figure ourselves out. Man, let's get back to that place where we're not taking the Lord and his word too casually. And it's not heavy, you all. All this leads to a blessing. Yes, there may be sacrifice. There may be submitting our flesh. We're supposed to take our cross and follow him anyways. But it leads to life and a life more abundant. I believe we're living in a time that requires immediate obedience. Abraham's an interesting case study of immediate obedience. God comes to him and to his only son that was born the right way. He says, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. Okay, the 930, my son was sitting on the front row and I used him as an example if God ever gave me that instruction, I'm just going to be honest, him and I are going to have, have a fight. Like, we're gonna, there's going to be a war. I'll kill for Logan, but I would never kill Logan. Sorry if that's harsh, but that's premeditated, and he can come visit me in prison the rest of my life. That's just what's going to happen. I'll take it with God afterwards. <laughs> but Abraham, the Bible says that he rose early the next morning and went to sacrifice his son. That's crazy, y'all. Immediate obedience. There's something about immediate. The Bible says that the devil will come immediately and steal the seed. The Holy Spirit reminds us of God's words. When we're going through situations of life or maybe a relationship struggle, the Holy Spirit's going to remind you of his word. My question for us is, are we going to immediately respond to it? Are we going to immediately do it? Or are we going to allow that seed to be dropped in our heart and the enemy to come and steal it? We've got to be faster than the enemy. The day that we live in, these days require immediate obedience. Psalms 119.60 says, I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. A stubborn heart is a stony heart. You sitting in that place of pride and being stumble, or, or hum, there we go, humble, or you know what I'm trying to say, prideful, does not allow God's word to take root in our hearts. We have got to be quick and immediate to respond to God's words, the, the, the word. The day we live in requires fearless obedience. Listen to this. Fear will either stop you from death, but it will also, or it can stop you from death or life. There's a healthy fear of cliffs and things like that, but it will also stop you from living. I think about the story of Israel again in Joshua chapter three. I could preach messages and messages and messages out of the story of Israel. But Joshua 3, they're out in the river, they're getting ready to cross over, they're getting ready to go take Jericho. Under the leadership of Moses, they decided to disobey God. They didn't carefully obey his instructions. They partially obeyed his instructions. Where they missed it is they decided in their own wisdom to go and send spies into the land. So disobedience opened the door to deception and fear. And as a result, Moses couldn't take his people in there. But Joshua was a leader of fearless obedience to God. And the instructions were that they're going to carry the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God, and they're supposed to go to the river, and the priests are going to lead the way, and they're going to step their foot in the river, and then the water's going to back up. The last time Israel crossed water, what happened? It was this, and the water spread, and there was this nice, clear pathway. They saw the miracle before they took the step last time. This time, God's asking them to take a step before they see the miracle. 
And I think this is an example of sometimes in our lives and maybe for somebody in the room today that God is asking you to take that step before you see a clear pathway. And it's not just a step of faith, it's a step of obedience. It's something that he's called you to go and do, but you have to take a step out before it becomes clear. And it's uncomfortable. You're not sure how it's going to work out. You're afraid. And it's a time and an hour that we live in that you've got to respond in fearless obedience to what he's calling you to do. God is love. The Bible says that faith works through love. He's never going to lead you into anything that's going to hurt or harm you. It might be difficult. It might be a sacrifice. It might be a challenge. But the outcome of it is going to be fulfilling. It's going to be contentment. Your joy is going to be full. You're going to be able to live that dream and the vision that God's put in your heart. There are times that God brings opportunities up and it's just a seed there's something in your heart right now that you're thinking, God, I want to go and do this. And you've been sitting on the sidelines for years of your life. And he keeps bringing opportunity and opportunity and opportunity to you, but it's in the form of a seed. It doesn't yet look like what you saw or what you see in your heart. And he's saying, just step into that, that seed of obedience. Take that step of obedience and allow the nature and the environment of obedience to cultivate that seed and to grow into the very thing that I've already shown you. It's a step of obedience. Yes, it requires faith. But when you add the word obedience, are you understanding my heart? There's an awe that comes with it. There's a, there's a weightiness. There's a responsibility that comes with it. Otherwise, we're just playing church. We're playing kingdom. Take a step of obedience today. Fearless obedience. The times we live in require focused obedience. We can't play. This is, this is for me, so I'm going to communicate it. There's a million things in life that I want to do. I've got my real estate license on the side. I've got, I mean, I want to, I mean, I get to travel the world. I've got, like, business ideas for every country we work in. And you, I, can't, I just can't do it all right now. And there's things that I know God's called me to do. And if there's, this, the word obedience is the word for my life this year. And God put it on my heart of focused obedience. And I was reminded of the story when Mary and Joseph went and took Jesus to Jerusalem for the Passover meal. And they're coming home and they're traveling in the caravan and they get home and they turn around and it's like, little Jesus isn't there. Where was he? They go back and they find him teaching in the synagogues and like, where were you? And he looks at his mom and children, don't ever talk to your parents like this. <laughs> Mary, don't you know I'm supposed to be about my father's business? He was focused. He was focused on what God called him to do. We live in a time where we can't play anymore. We got to get focused on who we're supposed to be. We got to get focused on, on being obedient to Jesus and what he's called you to do. We've got to get focused on his word. The world's not playing. We can't play. We get to the end of Jesus' life on the earth and he's up praying in the garden before he's taken to be crucified. And he's praying before the Lord, and the Bible says that he's so nervous and he's so scared, and he's praying that the sweat is literally like blood. It's blood dropping onto the ground. And his response was, God, not my will, but yours. What step of obedience is God requiring of you right now that you feel like you've been fighting and wrestling with God just like Jesus is, was? Your response Ephesians 5, 1, we're supposed to be the imitators of Christ. God, not my will, but yours. Who do I need to go and talk to? What relationship do I need to get out of because it's ungodly? What is it for you? Not my will, but yours. Immediate obedience, fearless obedience, focused obedience, sacrificial obedience. These are the times that we live in. I'm going to close with this verse, Psalm, or Philippians 2, 12 through 16. It says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important, work hard to show the result of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on that day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work 
was not useless. You might be sitting in here and it's like, man, I have no desire to be obedient to God. It might be because you've never given your life to Jesus, but this says once we do. The Bible even talks about old things have passed away, all things become new. When we give our life to the Lord and we truly submit our lives to God, that our heart begins to be rejuvenated. A transformation begins to happen. And a hunger and a desire to be obedient to his word and obedient to his leading begins to take place. Jesus took it so far as to say this. I will know that you love me by your obedience. John 14, 15, John 15, 14. I think it's fun how that worked out. Go read those two. That's serious. When we give our lives to God, there's this desire. There should be this desire to be obedient to him. If not... I think my question for all of us is today is, man, where are we then in disobedience? And our heart might be growing cold. These are the days that we live in. This is designed for us to look in to scripture and for us to begin to shape our own lives the right way, to be on guard. I communicate this because God loves you. I communicate this because I love you. Otherwise, I'm a hypocrite. These are things that guard and they protect us. They make us healthy. Love is the bond of perfection. Colossians 3.14, love is what binds us together and allows us to operate in, in, in humility and unity. This is God's design and his desire for the church. This is God's design and desire for our families. And yet we've allowed as the church the enemy to come in and wreak havoc because we've gotten outside of obedience, outside of the environment that God intended us to live in. And the great thing is, is like Jonah In his original disobedience, we see a story of God's mercy where he comes in and he puts Jonah in a belly, that would suck, of a fish, but he gives him another, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that at church, and then he gives him another chance. God's given us another chance. We can keep getting it right. His mercies are new every morning. This isn't to condemn. It is to guide and correct and to lift because on the other side of obedience is joy, a life full of contentment, the vision that you have for your family. Man, peace in your mind, peace in your heart, peace in your home, peace in your finances. These are all things that come as a result of obedience. It's a picture of the Garden of Eden. It puts us back into that secret place, into the atmosphere that God designed for us to do life. God, we just thank you, Father, for your word. God, I thank you for the people in this place. God, I thank you, Father, and we ask this morning, Lord, that you pour out your love in a new way, in a fresh way in our hearts God, that you give us a fresh revelation of your love in Jesus' name. God, I thank you, Father, for those that are struggling, like, including myself, Lord, stony and stubborn hearts. God, speak to these dry bones. Revive them. Holy Spirit, move. Move throughout our relationships. Move in our lives. God, I think that your word does not return void, but it goes forward and it accomplishes the very thing that you sent it to do. In Jesus' name, I want everybody to repeat this with me. God, I give you my life. I make you the Lord of my life. God, I ask that you fill my heart with your love. God, begin to do heart surgery in me. Transform me. Change me. God, help me to desire to be obedient to you. Show me and reveal things in my life where I may be in disobedience. Help me to discover that secret place again. Give me the strength, God, to be obedient. Give me the the courage to take the steps of faith, the steps of obedience that you've called me to. In Jesus' name. God, we surrender our lives to you again this morning. You are our boss, you are our leader. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for tuning in to Guts Church YouTube channel. I'm Pastor Chano Trevino, the assistant pastor here at Guts Church. And on behalf of our leadership team, our staff, our church, it's our hope that this message met you right where you are. If it did, I bet there's someone you know who could use the encouragement of this message in their life. And you sharing it with them can make all the difference. The mission of Guts Church is to help people win. And you can be a part of that simply by sharing, or better yet, inviting someone to tune into Guts Church online with you every week. Take that next step to be a part of what God is doing right now in this moment in time by being committed to showing up, placing a premium on God's word, and receiving all that God has for you. 
You can share this message, gather your friends for services, make it a priority to make this the place you want to be. God has so much for you. I truly believe that. We love you. We're praying for you. Can't wait to see you soon.